Welcome to this second, uh, second panel of Friday morning um, in this very relaxed atmosphere of being the day after the last day. And I would say very fitting with the last speaker of this panel, I would have liked to start this with Haydn's Abschiedssymphonie, the Departure Symphony. Um, uh, but we are, we are short of music here, so just, you have just to mentalize it. Good. Uh, we stick to the, to the sequence of this revised program. Um, uh, it's not in chronological order, but I suggest we stick to the program. The first speaker is Andreas Carrios, who will talk about the armed struggle against British colonial rule in Cyprus. Um, Andreas Carrios. Uh, has studied history and archaeology at the University of Athens, at the University of London. Um, and he holds a doctorate from the University of London. I skip the rest of the bio here. And please start and please keep within the time limits. You all know what the program is all about. Please. Thank you. Dear colleagues, uh, let me start by thanking you, thanking you for attending my presentation. And of course, uh, by congratulating the uh, committee, the international, uh, international uh, committee for organizing this uh, splendid uh, congress. Uh, my presentation, as already mentioned, uh, regards the Cypriot experience of uh, uh, independence, although through a paramilitary campaign, which took place during the late uh, 1950s. From uh, 1955 until 1959, EOCA's paramilitary campaign against British colonial rule aimed at enosis, the union of Cyprus with Greece. For various reasons, this aim was not attained. However, the EOCA campaign did activate a seismic shift in British policy. In 1960, this shift resulted in the establishment of the Republic of Cyprus as an independent sovereign state. In other words, the Republic of Cyprus is the outcome of a paramilitary campaign against the British. Recent years have witnessed the emergence of sophisticated studies which reveal the nature of EOCA's insurgent activities in colonial Cyprus during 1955 until 1959. These studies examine the lack of, of spontaneity or the deliberateness and centralized nature of these activities. Nevertheless, all deal obliquely with the physical insurgency, resulting in a hazy understanding of EOCA's campaign in many quarters. This presentation seeks to provide a broad understanding of EOCA as a subversive organization inquiring primarily into its strategy and modus operandi against the colonial forces in Cyprus. The analysis neither constitutes a history of certain EOCA groups, however, nor a record of individual actions. Instead, EOCA's campaign is put under investigation with particular attention to its mentality and evolution, to its key political priorities, and to the efforts of the security forces to repress the rebellion, influenced as these were by the political environment. When examining EOGAS and conventional warfare, it is fundamental to consider the limited nature of its military objectives. British military reports of that time state that when EOGA engaged in military action in April 1955, it sought neither an, ult an ultimate victory in the military sense, nor to seize control over any territorial portion of Cyprus, nor to carry out open warfare. By contrast, the movement aimed to press the British side to move away from its intransig intransigent position against self-determination and accept negotiations on this basis. Lieutenant Colonel George Grivas, <coughs> The military uh, commander of EOCA plainly mapped out the aims of the operational framework of the armed movement in a general plan drafted after his reconnoitring visit to the island in February 1953. This plan 
was later presented in Grivas's memoirs and outlined his approach that EOCA should exert pressure to influence public opinion until the United Nations and principally Britain were forced to examine the Cypriot case and eventually satisfy the Greek Cypriot desiderata. This was to be achieved by carrying out sabotage operations to force Britain to lose its ability to exercise control over the island, reverse its negative policy, and begin discussions about the future international status of Cyprus. It must be emphasized that Grivas categorically stated in his plan that to push Britain towards a diplomatic solution, EOGA aimed, aimed at a total victory against the British forces on a psychological rather than military level. Since a purely military result could not be attained in the face of Britain's advanced military equipment and the insular nature of the operational terrain, military force had to, be, had to be subordinated to political criteria. The value of the physical struggle was confined because the armed Enosis movement could not unilateral, unilaterally settle the matter. A definite resolution of the Cyprus question had to be agreed ultimately with the colonial power so, the strategic thinking behind the establishment of the armed Enosis movement necessarily taking into consideration the geographical peculiarities of the island envisaged an eventual negotiation between Greece or the Greek Cypriots and Britain itself. Here, we need to be explicit regarding the strategic principles of the armed Enosis movement. Union with Greece would not be the direct product of the organization's pattern of activities, but the result of a successful political engineering by those who were to negotiate on behalf of the Greek Cypriots, perhaps Archbishop Macarius III, or the Greek government, and who were to be provided with a window, uh, with a window of opportunity once EOCA at last drove London to a definite resolution. Therefore, the armed movement had an extremely difficult mission to accomplish. On the one hand, its operations had to be effective enough to force the British to negotiate a political settlement. On the other, its insurgent campaign must not destroy the bridges which those concerned would sooner or later have to cross. <coughs> EOGA's tactics changed and evolved in response to the ebb and flow of the developments on the Cypriot home front and, international, and in international fora. The conversion of these necessities into military action was accomplished by Lieutenant Colonel George Grievous. While the principal aim, namely to provoke a repressive reaction by the British which would increase international pressure to force them to negotiate, remained constant, and continual uh, switch from one method of attack to another was implemented to resist British efforts to defeat the insurgency while simultaneously keeping the armed Enosis movement, movement in the public eye. Grivas would in one phase order sabotage against government installations and then in another conduct ambushes against military vehicles or individual attacks against members of the colonial, of the colonial garrison. Except for various patterns of irregular warfare undertaken by the armed wing, including raids on police stations and armories, shootings, bombings, landmines, ambushes, arson, and sabotage, EOCA's modus operandi also included the mobilization of the Greek Cypriot masses to disrupt civil order and stability. Popular protest methods uh, included general strikes, demonstrations, rioting, leafleting, sloganeering, and passive resistance, such as the boycott of British goods. Moreover, EOCA also internationally stepped back from violence. Indeed, four official truces were declared to create space for political initiatives, though the hardcore members of the movement used this space to regroup and reorganize. 
These were not truces in the proper sense of the word, namely a mutual agreement between opponents to suspend hostilities for a specific period of time, and consequently, they were not accepted by the British authorities, who alleged they would only benefit one party, EOGA. The sum of uh, EOCA's methods allowed the organization to maintain a consistent level of activity for the duration of the physical insurgency, and its hard core was more or less intact when the Zurich and London settlement was achieved in 1959. In fact, for the longest period of the struggle, large numbers of security personnel reinforced the Cyprus garrison. For instance, nearly 16,000 men in autumn 1955, around 36,000 in late 1956, and almost 30,000 in June 1958, and all this to control a population of uh, 450,000 uh, citizens. Nonetheless, the colonial regime, despite being aided by so many formations and by the evolution of its tactical anti-terrorist principles from the big sweeps uh, involving significant amounts of troops to brains and not brawn, namely small bodies of troops acting on definite information, all this in 1958, uh, eventually was unsuccessful in subduing EOCA. Cyprus, during 1955 until 1959, is therefore generally considered by specialists on revolt and counterinsurgency studies a model of failure for a counterinsurgency policy. EOCA's activities not only confused and exasperated the colonial forces, but also raised the political cost for British control over the island. In particular, they provoked a repressive response by London involving curfews, collective fines, extensive arrests, detention camps, and mistreatment of the population, which became so much a, a part of the Greek Cypriot experience. Anglo-Cypriot relations were seriously damaged, and the polarization between the Greek Cypriot masses and the colonial authorities was significantly augmented. Not surprisingly, British military reports state that by the end of the insurgency, EOCA could call upon the support or sympathy of at least 70% of the Greek Cypriot community. Consequently, the challenge posed by the subversive organization kept the armed struggle on the front page of the newspapers, increased international pressure on its opponent, and occasionally, and occasionally even affected diplomatic intervention by third parties, uh, such as the United States intervention twice in 1956 and the NATO initiative in 1958. Above all, EOCA's efforts, always backed by international diplomatic campaigning by Greece, played a significant role in forcing London to view the Cyprus question in a new light, moving away from the never position it publicly expressed in 1954. Regarding the British security casualties inflicted by Yoga, there is some dispute over the figures provided so far. For instance, the official casualty list reports 156 members of the colonial forces were killed and 788 wounded, in addition to 35 British civilian deaths. According to George Grivas, the figures are 417 killed and, seven, uh, and 702 wounded, both military and policemen. Uh, Major General Kenneth Darling states in a report prepared immediately after the end of the insurgency that, that casualties for the British side were 156 security members killed and 788 wounded, with 26 British civilians killed and 49 wounded due to EOGA activities. Finally, the British Cyprus Memorial established relatively uh, recently in Kerinya at the northern part of Cyprus, 
honors the memory of 371 British service, servicemen who died while on active service during the four-year conflict. The above figures neither adequately re reflect EOGA's subversive activities, nor do they provide a fair assessment of the challenge the organization posed for the British side. Many of EOGA's operations did not result in killing or wounding, and during the first months of 1955, they did not intend to do so. Blowing up military installations, sabotaging aircrafts, and burning military storehouses often did not result in bloodshed. Uh, many such non-lethal incidents took place which together with popular protest and resistance, shook the foundations of colonial rule. To take an instance, while 2,976 bombs were defused, still 1,782 EOCA bombs exploded during the campaign, causing a 10 million of pounds damage. It was precisely by providing a clear proof that Britain was not in control of uh, conditions in the colony that EOCA expected to secure its political ends. And to conclude, the present analysis has focused on EOCA's strategic mentality. From the very beginning, the leadership of the armed Enosis movement had no pretensions about its ability to achieve a victory in a purely military sense, as in the seizure of territory, or to conduct open warfare, uh, open regular warfare. Its objective was always to make continued control of the colony impossible for the British government, thereby making Cyprus a real issue despite the efforts of London to rule it out of court over, over a long period. Consequently, the organization's plan of actions was devised to perform three intended, intended tasks. First, to convince London that Cyprus will be a liability if it had to be held by force and to consequently provide Macarius and Athens with opportunities to negotiate the island's future. Second, to resist any effort by the colonial forces to effectively police the insurgency, and finally, to increase international pressure on Britain to fulfill Greek Cypriot aspirations. Indeed, EOGA's methods constantly changed to respond to the ebb and flow of developments and were implemented to affect events in Cyprus and draw international attention to the island. Its campaign, sought to force the UN, the United Nations, to address the Cyprus question, but the outcome of any United Nations resolution was dependent on Athens' efforts to press other member states to support the Greeks of Cyprus, particularly Greece's allies. Its chosen pattern of activities included the usual forms of irregular warfare, transformed into calculated action in the urban areas and the mountains, but also in the countryside. Simultaneously, at certain points and after EOGA's instructions, the Greek Cypriot masses also engaged in destabilizing activities of popular protest. Yet, alongside the use of force, EOGA also promoted its political goals with a, with a calculated remove from action. Indeed, the clandestine organization was highly flexible in its, in its tactics as in its announcement of temporary ceasefires. This practice proved useful by helping EOCA periodically regroup, but primarily in putting Britain under pressure to respond to the gestures made by the armed Enosis movement. As a result, EOCA's strategy and methods during the physical insurgency in Cyprus backed by Greek diplomacy at the international level, was effective in undermining the foundations of colonial rule on the island, though the political outcome was not enosis, union of Cyprus with Greece, but a compromise that provided for an independent Cyprus. Thank you for your attention. Andrea, thank you very much for this interesting presentation. Thank you also very much for keeping within time limits. 
Um, as on the previous panel, I would suggest to have questions and answers immediately after each speaker because the subjects are so divergent. So any question? One, two, three, four very brief questions. One minute each, at the utmost. Yes. Uh, this uh, combat uh, with EOCA, uh, it happens during the Cold War. I would like to know if uh, there are any kind of ideology of EOCA. Uh, that's it. Edward Maroldi, United States. <clears throat> what was the activity of the Turkish pot? the Turkish population on Cyprus during this period? At the at final peace agreement, when they de, uh, ended the war, Aoka was to disarm under supervision, and it turned out they had a vast amount of weaponry, bazookas, heavy machine guns. With all the Royal Navy effort to patrol the coasts, how did they get all of that weaponry into Cyprus? Hi, I'm Martin Meisel, Tel Aviv University. I just wonder about the EOCA appreciation of the British intentions and the British uh, appreciation why and how they would have eventually to withdraw from Cyprus. I mean, you, Can you please repeat? Uh, I didn't get uh, the whole question. Uh, what you presented very nicely, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, the EOCA mechanism, intention, strategy, etc., etc. But I wonder what uh, was there any appreciation by EOCA of the British intentions, British strategy, and whether there was any appreciation that the, at the end, not only hope but appreciation that at the very end the Brits would go out. Did it make us clear? Okay, okay. Let's start answering. It's four questions, right? Oh, especially the one about the Turkish Cypriots, I would need a, fi a fair amount of time. Anyway, just uh, briefly. Uh, regarding ideology, uh, EOCA did not dispute neither the future social and economical organization of Cyprus, all right, uh, nor uh, the detachment of Cyprus from a country which belonged to the Western Alliance in order to follow a different path. The aim of EOCA, the political aim of EOCA was liberation, termination of the colonial rule, and union with a country which, whose part was definitely on the Western Alliance. All right. So EOCA was not anti-NATOist, uh, nor a communist or socialist, or it did not propose, it did not include in, in its program and in its publications um, any aspiration about the future system of the uh, mean, means of production in, in Cyprus. All right. Uh, and it was successful in this part because at the beginning of the insurgency, the British tried to make a connection of EOCA with the, with the communist anti-colonial movements uh, in order to attract sympathy within the, nest, the uh, NATO alliance. However, it was not successful because, simply because in the lead of EOCA was a clergyman, Archbishop Magarios. And the leadership of the Communist Party of Cyprus uh, plainly ordered its followers not to participate in uh, the ranks, not to be recruited by Oka. However, most of them disobeyed and did participate in the Oka. However, this uh, came to be uh, uh, to the benefit of Oka because Oka could not be accused in international fora as a communist or a left-wing organization. Question number one. Question number two, the Turkish Cypriots. All right, first of all, the Turkish Cypriots were 
a minority in Cyprus uh, of 18%, which, however, did not resident in a specific part of Cyprus. They were spread through the whole uh, landmass of Cyprus. The Turkish Cypriots, during the whole period of, of the British colonial rule, were more close to the British than to the Greek Cypriots. As a matter of fact, what the, the, the Turkish Cypriots constantly asked was either continuation of the British rule or uh, if the British decided to withdraw from Cyprus, Cyprus to be ceded to Turkey. All right. And all this until 1956, when after British encouragement, the Turkish side and the Turkish Cypriot side um, adopted partition of Cyprus as their own uh, collective uh, aim. Despite that this was not a realistic solution because without the use of violence, how to split Cyprus in order to achieve partition uh, provided that the population of the Turkish Cypriots was spread in the whole landmass of Cyprus. On the military field now, the Turkish Cypriots uh, were recruited by the colonial of authorities in, a vastly, in vastly amounts to serve as policemen uh, in order to uh, assist the British defeat EOKA. Especially two new units were formed, staffed exclusively from the Turkish Cypriot ranks, the auxiliary, the auxiliary police and the mobile reserve police. And aside from this, they also uh, created their own secret armed organizations, which were not that effective, were not that powerful. It were, it, they were mostly of uh, a local range. Until 1957, when all these organizations were united, under the umbrella of a sole organization called TMT, the Turkish Resistance Movement. And in August 1958, uh, this Turkish Cypriot organization went under the operational control of Turkey itself when it sent a Turkish colonel to undertake the leadership of this organization. And henceforth, the TMT uh, acted as the arm as the grasp of Turkey to Cyprus. Aside from this, uh, the Turkish Cypriots in summer 1958, realizing that uh, partition is not able to achieve on the ground because of the ethnographic realities, decided to pursue a de facto partition of the island to create the conditions for a de facto partition by launching the so-called Taksim Offensive, the Offensive for Partition, which uh, provided for uh, massive attacks against uh, Greek Cypriot population and their, to and their uh, properties in order to force them withdraw from their premises, from their houses, these pieces of land to be undertaken, to be occupied by the Turkish Cypriots, thereby creating small pieces of land which will be uh, controlled exclusively by the Turkish Cypriots, creating ethnically, uh, ethnically clean uh, territories. However, they were not successful because, at the end because of the ethnographic realities. The, uh, Greek Cypriots were four times more than the, the Turkish Cypriots, and because of the effective defense uh, organized by EOKA, uh, the EOKA organized the population in order to effectively counter uh, the Taksim offensive. That's enough about the, the Turkish Cypriots. It's a complicated man manner, basically. Uh, the Oka movement, uh, from being an anti-colonial effort, because of the British engineering, at some point turned to be also an intercommunal dispute, while at the same time fighting against the British. Uh, it, it's complicated. If the Cyprus question and the Cyprus problem in general is a complex uh, situation. Uh, question number three about the Oka's armory. Uh, and Arsenal. Uh, 
first of all, EOCA did not possess uh, enough equipment in terms of machine guns. Uh, only two mortars, if I recall correctly, but I need to check my, uh, my data. Uh, most of EOCA, of EOCA men were, um, n first of all, the armed wing did not uh, exceed a number of 200, 300 combatants at any stage of the revolt, all right? Uh, because Cyprus was an island, it was difficult to import, to smuggle in huge quantities of arms in order to equip the Greeks, all the Greek, uh, the Greek Cypriot supporters of the movement. Um, so it was arm, arms, um, basically the sources came basically from stealing from the British, uh, especially after raids in police stations, uh, from the previous clandestine organization that Grivas uh, maintained during uh, the Greek uh, uh, resistance movement against the Axis occupation in the uh, early until mid-1940s. Two shipments arrived from Greece before the, the, uh, the launching of EOGA's uh, insurgent campaign. But after this, the British uh, imposed effective anti-smuggling measures, um, raids in police stations, and uh, after 1956, the Greek government decided to equip EOGA and start sending some amounts of uh, of material, of equipment, which, however, uh, especially after the augmentation of EOCA's activities, we are not enough in order to support effectively, correspond effectively to the uh, EOCA needs. And uh, that is why uh, Grivas in, uh, decided to equip uh, his um, guerrilla men in the countryside, not up in the mountains, with shotguns, uh, EOGA confiscated uh, 800 shotguns from uh, the Greek Cypriots, which through a, a, tra a transformation in cartridges made them more effective. And also EOGA proved to be very impressive in make it on your own. It produced so many bombs and explosive devices using everyday materials, for example, some of the most powerful bombs devised by Yoga were the pipe bombs, using pipes for agricultural purposes, as well as uh, substances uh, from commercial channels, uh, such as uh, fertilizers, for example. Uh, so Andreas. that's pretty much about the equipment of Yoga, and although much more can be uh, said. And, and what about... And with a view to the time schedule, I would sup suppose to leave the fourth question uh, to a private discussion in the next coffee break, right. because otherwise it would lead a little bit too long. Sure, thank yeah. you very much, Andreas. I think it was a very no, thank you. Thank you for your question. So we now come to the second presentation of this, uh, this panel. It's um, Professor Dr. Kim Seong Ki from South Korea. He is a military officer, attended the military academy, and is now a professor at the Joint Staff College. Um, he worked on North Korean uh, nuclear ambitions as well as the history of changes of national defense policy. And he's going to talk a review in Korea's uh, performance uh, uh, in the war of independence against the Japanese. Please, Professor Kim. Oh, in chair, uh, thank you for your wonderful inter introduction. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Kim Seung Gi, Kim Seung Gi, uh, from South Korea. I'm gratefully honored to present here. Uh, the subject of my presentation deals with the collapse of uh, Japanese empire and the recovery of colonial Korea. Therefore, I can say that today's presentation is meaningful 
because it is one of representative examples of Asian region that meets the main subject of 2018 ICMH. Uh, order of presentation uh, is as following. Uh, the Korean provisional governments, the independence army, the Korea provisional government's diplomatic activity. The purpose of this paper is to remove the performance of the war of independence against the Japanese empire executed by the Korea provisional government here in after KPG and the Korean Independence Army, here in Africa, KIA. I had two questions in uh, writing this paper. Was Korea's independence after the end of World War II due to the victory and spontaneous uh, decision of the Allies powers? And has Korea not contributed to it. Uh, so I wanted to find out if Korea provisional government and the independence army had contributed to Korea's independence after World War II. Uh, this is the Northwestern Asia's situation. Japanese empire concluded by force and illegally the Korea-Japan Annexation Treaty with Korea, 1910. The Japanese Empire colonized Korea, having military rule. Since the Korea-Japan Annexation Treaty, many Koreans exiled in the Manchurian of China and the maritime provinces of Russia and built bases of armed independence movement there. After the old Korean March 1st independence movement, Korean in the Manchuria and the maritime provinces area formed many armed forces to gain independence. Love map. Uh, this area, the Manchuria of China. This area, the maritime provinces of Russia. The yellow uh, area the uh, uh, was called Gando. The buffer zone between Korea and the Qing Dynasty and was the area where many Koreans exiled themselves after the coloni colonization of Korea. The Gando was divided into West Gando, North Gando. Now let's look at the establishment of the Korean provisional government. First background, the March 1st movement happened on March 1st, 1919. This movement is the greatest event in the Korean national movement history that insists on freedom and independence against the Japanese colonial military rule. Ethnic leaders were very aware of the necessity of organic and long-term struggles with the highest governing body. Therefore, the provisional governments were established in the Man Manchuria and uh, maritime provinces of Russia, Shanghai of China, and the Seoul of Korea. The representatives of the provisional governments agreed on the establishment of an integrated and unique provisional government 
based on the provisional constitution of the Republic of Korea on September 1919. Uh, this, pic this picture shows the first office of provisional government in Shanghai. Uh, first, a provisional government promoted policy to prepare for the world of independence. Established the act on the command and control of military body and constituted armed oriented military. And established the armed independence war route. route. Its supposed uh, KPG's uh, strategy was attrition warfare strategy. Uh, that strategy is to make the enemy tired and build up its abilities of war by guerrilla warfare and secret agent and win the final war by regular warfare. Uh, in the early time of the uh, provisional government era, uh, 50 units in total were organized in Manchuria and maritime provinces. Uh, this unit is, was different from uh, Korean Independence Army in, uh, established in 1940. The uh, Korean uh, provisional government guided on the integrity of the units and the execution of their operation. Now I'll, till, I'll uh, turn the topic into the establishment of Korean Independence Army. First, Uh, Shino uh, Japanese War outbroke in July 1937. Provisional government planned to prepare for the war of independence for the next three years. It negotiated with the Chinese government on the creation of Korean Independence Army in 1940. Independence Army was established in September 1940. Independence Army was the national armed forces of the provisional government. The army was under the direct control of provisional government's premier. Independence Army aimed to organized three divisions, but first consists of four branch units, like that table. And now let's look at Independence Army's combined operations with the United Kingdom Army. The activities of propaganda and psychological warfare of Independence Army in the Chinese anti-Japanese front were highly evaluated by the headquarters of the British Army in India. So Korean headquarters and the United Kingdom command agreed to dispatch selected soldiers of Independence Army to India and Burma Front. Independence Army's agent team committed to Impal Front with the British units. The units exec uh, executed, executed the anti-Japanese broadcasting, translation of enemy documents, drafting of leaflets, Interrogation of POI, POW. 
The Allied Armed Forces completely defeated the Japanese army in Burma in 1945. Uh, in Pearl Front, uh, British Army here, here, uh, here, and uh, Korean Independence Army here. Now, about the uh, Independence Army's combined operas, operations with the U.S. Army. Independence Army carried out special training for the trade Korea in infiltration operation with the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staffs, Office of Strategic, Strategic Service, OSS. OSS agreed to uh, Korean and OSS headquarters agreed to, to do U.S.-Korea military cooperation with the U.S. 14th Air Force. Air Corps. U.S. OSS ex uh, executed special training such as armed intelligence activities of 112 uh, soldiers of uh, KIA uh, from uh, May 1945 for three months. Although the operation to infiltration into Korea had been planned. The plan did not be executed because of the, the early surrender of Japanese Empire. A black line is the largest advan advancement of Japan. And blue Line and Allied counterattack, uh, Indo Burma Front, the Pacific Front, the Manju Front. Uh, the second branch unit of Independence Army and OSS soldiers, and third branch unit and the OSS soldiers. Now I'll turn the topic into the diplomatic activity for independence. The provisional government declared war against Japan on December 1941. For the background of the Cairo summit conference, The United States President Roosevelt proposed to China leader Jiang Jies to hold a summit conference to discuss the world capabilities of two countries. The United States needed China's cooperation with win the Pacific War. China agreed to the U.S. proposal because of the absolute need for U.S. ordnance supply and air force support. The declaration of war against Japan. Kim Gu of Korean leader requested talks to Jiang Jies of China and Talks between Kim Gu and Jiang Jie was held in July 1943. Jiang Jie accepted the request of the provisional government's key figures and promised to do his utmost to guarantee Korea's complete independence in the upcoming Cairo Summit Conference. Uh, these talks were indeed historical and epoch-making. Kim Gu Jiang Jie The Chinese side document recorded the talks of 
Kim Gu and Zhang Jie Si on July 26, 1943. Zhang Jie Si, Roosevelt Churchill. <laughs> okay, 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 I, I understand you. The Cairo Summit Conference was held on November 1945. Roosevelt had tried to reach agreement with China on trusteeship, not on the complete independence of Korea. Churchill opposed the Zhang Jie's opinions as it would directly spark the independence movement in India. Zhang Jie's urged to guarantee Korean independence and announced the promise statement promptly. Finally, the three servants jointly declared the promise to guarantee Korea's independence in due course after the end of World War II. This declaration was reaffirmed in the Potsdam Declaration, and Korea recovered its independence from Japanese Empire after the war. It was the first time in history that the world powers made a joint announcement announce to guarantee independence of a particular country. Okay, my, uh, okay that's my mistaken. Uh, 1943. Now it is time to sum up my points. The Allied powers jointly announced to guarantee Korean independence after the, the end of the World War II. Until the agreement in Cairo Conference was accomplished, the United Kingdom and the United States opposed the guarantee of Korea's independence only China strongly urged it. It was not a spontaneous decision of the U.S. and the United Kingdom themselves. <clears throat> I believe it was possible because the efforts of the Korea Provisional Government and the Korean Independence Army moved the allies. Korea moved China. China moved the U.S. U.S. moved to U.K., I think so. Next, for the action uh, that uh, provisional government and the independence army contributed to the Korea's independence, first major action was that provisional government declared war against the Japanese empire immediately after Japan's the surprise attack of Pearl Harbor. The declaration attracted the, the attention of the Allied Armed Officers and made the opportunity for the Independence Army to participate in the Korea-UK and Korea-US combined operations. Second major action was the provisional government strengthened the anti-Japanese joint front of the Korea-China after the Sino-Chinese uh, Japanese war. The provisional government strengthened the anti-Japanese joint prone since the March 1st Movement Memorial Gov uh, Convention in 1942, which became the turning point for the improvement of the Korea-China relations. 
the third action was that the Independence Army participated in the Korea United Kingdom and the Korea United States combined operations. For the joint operations with the British Army in India, the Independence Army dispatched the Independence Army Psychological Warfare Agent Team to the India-Burma Front. For the joint operations with the U.S. Army in China, the United States uh, Independence Army conducted the Korea-U.S. combined Eagle training with the U.S. Office of Strategic, Strategic Services, OSS, and compelled the infiltration operations to Korea. I'll conclude my briefing. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for this, this presentation and also for staying within the time limits, which gives us the time for up to three questions, provided they are short. Should there be any? Please. Uh, you said that uh, China was one of the, um, the main movers uh, to guarantee independence for Korea. And yet, and, and China moved uh, the U.S. and the U.S. moved the U.K. But within a couple of years of World War II, uh, China invaded Korea. Uh, and the United States came in to help defend, and that's when we got the current situation. What was the difference? Was it that the communists ch ha had uh, taken over China and they did not agree to an independent Korea? Okay, uh, excuse me. Last, last sentence. Uh, did you, sh shall I repeat the question? The last part. Uh, was the difference that uh, Chiang Kai-shek had been in favor of an independent Korea, but the communists in China were not. Is that why China invaded soon after World War II? Okay, uh, okay thank, you very, uh, thank you for your good question. Are there, uh, are there any other questions? Mm -hmm. Sh yeah, let's start with this one and then we'll see whether we have time. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the powers uh, uh, to support and help Korean independence uh, is or uh, was the uh, Freedom, freedom uh, government, Kuomintang, not the Communist uh, Party. Uh, at that at the time, the Kuomintang uh, and Gongsandang uh, Communist Party uh, it, uh, has the uh, good uh, relationship uh, to uh, in, uh, to. Uh, uh, protect the Japanese invade on uh, inland. Uh, so uh, I said I said uh, China, the uh, freedom uh, government, uh, nationalism nationalism government, Jiang uh, uh, not the, the uh, Mao Zedong or the Communist Party. Okay. okay, another question. The uh, KIA was formed in Manchuria, correct? Did KIA forces operate into Korea directly? Uh, uh, no, sir. Uh, the KIA uh, uh, had had the had planned the 
uh, domestic infiltration operation, uh, but uh, 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 that plan uh, uh, could not executed. executed. Uh, but uh, the uh, representative of the Korean Independence Army's uh, armies and the uh, United, uh, United States uh, OSS uh, entered the uh, entered the uh, Korean Peninsula in uh, Seoul uh, to. The solve the resolve the uh, in the, uh, Japanese the armed 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 forces. Uh, twenty uh, August twenty uh, nineteen forty-five. Okay, I would suggest to leave it at that. Um, thank you very much for this presentation from a totally different part of the world. Thank you very much. Sir. And now from the bitter lemons of Cyprus and another divided country, we'll move on to the First World War. We have Alon Klebanov, who uh, will talk uh, about uh, World War I in Hebrew literature. Um, to introduce Professor Alon Klebanov to you is uh, yeah, the famous calls to Newcastle or something, because most of you probably if you have not known him before, you know him by now. Um, he studied at Tel Aviv University and at the Royal Military Academy uh, under uh, David Chandler, is a sp uh, specializing in Napoleonic uh, history. He is also a founder member of the Israeli Napoleonic Society and the, and the International Napoleonic Society. Uh, he has been a lo for a long time instructed Israel's uh, uh, staff and, uh, and Command. general staff and command college, sorry. And apart from that, he's a passionate for art and music and their connections to history. And I can myself testify that this is really the case. So, Alon, you have the floor. Thank you. If you said earlier, you mentioned the Abjid Symphony, uh, that would be proper to mention the War Requiem by Benjamin Britten, which is, uh, I think, the musical equivalent. First of all, good morning to you all. Good afternoon, oh, almost good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Four years ago, in September 2014, at the 2014 ICMH conference in Varna, Bulgaria, which was dedicated to the centenary of the outbreak of the First World War, I presented a lecture which I called The Muses Did Not Fall Silent. This lecture dealt with the reflection of World War I in world literature. I brought many examples of poets, from different nations and armies, some of which were Jewish. I included one Hebrew poem, which I translated to English as no translation was available. Upon learning that the 2018 conference is to be held in Israel and dedicated to the centenary of the end of the First World War, as well as to the War of Independence and the birth of the State of Israel, I thought it was only appropriate to return to the subject and to concentrate on the role this momentous event played in the history of Hebrew literature. The most ancient Hebrew literature is, of course, the biblical. Although the Bible, the Old Testament for us, is so much more than literature alone, as it contains so many other genres, history, poetry, law, prophecy, hymns, etc., uh, it's, uh, the, we have some examples of other literature from ancient times. Even after the Old Testament was completed and sealed, the literary tradition continued to be primarily religious. The deuterocanonical books, the Mishnah, the Talmud, etc. Roughly the same time, the first non-religious literary works in Hebrew start appearing, including fascinating examples from the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Hebrew language is also undergoing important changes during this period. This phenomenon continued into the Middle Ages. The vast majority of Hebrew literary activi activity was dedicated to religious writings, but a steady trickle of secular works also continued, including studies in Hebrew grammar, philosophy, ethics, natural sciences, medicine, etc. Jewish intellectuals were influenced by trends in the various cultures of their countries of residence, all of which became reflected in Hebrew works. It should be remembered 
that during this period, Hebrew was not used as a spoken language in everyday use. Jews used Hebrew to read the Bible and to pray, but only a small elite used it for cultural purposes. For example, in the Renaissance, the first Hebrew theater plays were published. The first Hebrew book was printed in 1475. This is, of course, Gutenberg's Bible. Uh, but very shortly afterwards, I mean, already 1475, the first Hebrew Bible is printed. Within a short time, uh, Hebrew printing presses were sprouting all over Europe, including one of the most famous ones in Venice, which was actually headed by a non-Jew, becoming one of the most famous printing, Jew, Hebrew printing presses in the world. The French Revolution changes the reality and the political climate in Europe and carries the message of equality. The French Revolution's great son, Napoleon Bonaparte, disseminates the message of revolution and physically breaches the walls of the ghetto wherever he goes. In the Jewish world, a significant change takes place when the Haskalah, the Jewish Enlightenment movement, is born within the traditional Jewish society. Cultural revival and an emphasis on language as an element of identity, as highlighted by German thinkers like Herder, for example, uh, also uh, influences the Jewish world. This is the period in which the interest in the Hebrew language is renewed. Hebrew press is born, such as Hameasef, the first journal in the Hebrew language. This is the first uh, copy, very first copy, 1784, dedicated to Josephus, the emperor, Joseph II. Habsburg, Vienna, of course. Uh, and this is the uh, 17, well, no, 1789 copy, with the first reports of the French Revolution. Uh, this Hameasef and other journals made it easier for Jewish communities to increase their access to secular texts in Hebrew. Gradually, the Hebrew press expanded in the struggle over readers with the Jewish press in local languages, and of course the Jewish languages like Yiddish and Ladino. Original and translated plays started appearing in Hebrew. In the opinion of one of the most important literary researchers, Dr. Orzion Bartana, and I quote, Hebrew literature was the main expression of the crystallization of Jewish identity in the modern era. He, who was no longer content only with the religious institutions and the traditional solutions from time immemorial, as full as exclusive answers, chose literature as the only tool in, at his disposal to express his views. Toward the end of the 19th century, the influence of modern European literature on Hebrew literature, which developed regardless of the advent of Zionism, greatly increased. The revival process of the Hebrew language was in fact moving in two parallel lines. The revival of written literary Hebrew and the revival of spoken Hebrew. In the first deca decades, these processes were disconnected from each other and even occurred in different places. Literary Hebrew was revived in European cities while spoken Hebrew developed mainly in the land of Israel, Palestine, then the Ottoman county. Uh, many of the Hebrew authors who wrote in Europe did so for cultural reasons, quite a few being even non-Zionist. On the other hand, the revival of the Hebrew language in Palestine was much more linked to the development of the Zionist idea. The revival of Hebrew provides us with the only example in history, as far as I know, uh, not only for the rebirth of a dead language, but also the, for the creation of a great literary tradition in a language which was not the mother tongue of any of its creators. Yesterday, the slip of the tongue of uh, Massimo, Professor Leonardis, who is unfortunately not with us, the Irish, the Irish is an example of a nation creating in the language of, of the oppressor, of the conqueror, whatever you like to call it. But in Hebrew, it's, it's an unbelievable tradition because or, 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 uh, it's, it's a Play, it's a uh, tradition in which all the founders uh, are composing works of literature in a language which is not their mother tongue. I have never seen any equivalent for that. Um, since its inception, uh, oh, sorry, uh, when the First World War broke out, Hebrew literature was in tremendous swing. A large group of extraordinary writers, both of poetry and, pro of, and prose, was then at, a, at various stages of rich and fruitful creative activity. It can be maintained that the literary achievements of the first two decades of the 20th century are the foundations of Hebrew, Hebrew literary culture. Uh, 
I will mention only a few of the main writers who were active in 1914 and are familiar to every Hebrew speaker. Bialik and Chernichovsky, Schneur and Fichmann, Brenner and Berdichevsky, Gershon Schofman and Dvora Baron, Uri Zvi Greenberg and Jakob Steinberg, Shmuel Yosef Agnon, future Nobel Prize laureate, and David Frischmann. Most of these illustrious authors still lived in Europe, and only a few worked in Ottoman Palestine. Since its inception, Hebrew literature was interacted with the reality around it, and with word literature. It was only natural that a large-scale dramatic event with both individual and universal implications, like the First World War, would be hugely reflected. The vast majority of the Hebrew authors were active in the countries directly involved in the war, and they were all affected personally, as were all the people in these countries. As emphasized in my 2014 paper, no war in history has received such significant literary expression in real time as the First World War, with Hebrew literature not dissimilar. And not an exception. The Hebrew literary works can be divided into two groups. Those whose universal message in their core, their objective all-encompassing, such as, such as happen, uh, just happened to be composed in Hebrew. The other concentrates on the subjective, the specifically Jewish message. As a comparison, one may draw a parallel between Wilfred Owen's poems dealing with the human tragedy of the war, in contrast to Rupert Brooks uh, poem, for example, The Soldier and others, which is one of the most prominent of many patriotic poets characterizing the first stage of the war. The parallel in Hebrew literature for these works is a group of poems and stories which concentrate on the Jewish elements, highlighting the complexity and multifaceted nature of the situation in which the fate of the Jews altered so radically, both as individuals and as part of whole communities which were shaken by the great storm. The combination of the different perspectives of all the Jewish poets and writers who fought in all the armies or describe, or describe the situation on both sides of the front lines provides us with a complex and varied picture, which reflects the complexity of the Jewish question. Uri Zvi Greenberg was born in 1896 in the town of Bieli Kamin in southern Galicia then in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and grew up in Lemberg, later Lvov, capital of Eastern Galicia. Galicia, Galicia, depending on the pronunciation. Although Lvov was not central to Hebrew culture as Odessa or Warsaw, the Hebrew cultural scene was nevertheless dynamic enough to simulate and excite the young man. At the age of 16, he published his first romantic and sensitive poems, both in Hebrew and Yiddish. Shortly after the outbreak of the First World War, Galicia was captured by the Russian army, but in 1915, the Austro-Hungarian army returned to the area and quickly recruited every available person. At the age of 19, Uri Zvi Greenberg found himself drafted into the army, although he had not yet reached the legal conscription age of 21 years. After short training, the young soldier's outfit was thrown into the large-scale autumn offensive. In order to reach Belgrade, the Austro-Hungarian army had to cross the Sava River, one of the tri great tributaries of the Danube. The fighting was heavy and bloody. Many soldiers were killed. During the, during the crossing of the river, and even more injured during the assault on the barbed wire and circled third positions. Once the attack was over, the stunned Greenberg found himself as the only survivor inside a third position, with all its defenders killed and all the bodies of the other attackers hanging on the barbed wire. In the heavy silence, suddenly the moon showed up between the heavy autumn clouds. He would later compose a Hebrew poem called In Memoriam, or Remembrance, although the accurate translation should be the Jewish term, Remembrance of Souls. By the way, this is his uh, autoportrait. He was a painter as well. This is the poem. Deep in the hour of the bottom of time, and like in a purest religion, the inner side of men is revealed. Beyond the external, in the twilight, pray hard to attain the form of flesh. Ah, if only I could bear the bitterness of the cup I had to rise, to raise with upturned eyes for my brother soldiers with whom I reached the Sava River, who fell with their feet up into the iron entanglements, and so short was the wail of their agony. They died so dark then. And I stood there like the last fighting men on earth, 
and saw my brothers growing up upside down, feet up, until reaching upward, in death kicking the heavens, and the moon I have seen rubbing its silvery face on the worn nails, on the shoe soles of upturned soldiers. And this terrible glow on the shoe nails of the heaven kicking dead electrified my life with a frightful death glow. And in my fear, I saw divinity and the fall of men in the eyes of flesh. And I cried then like the last crying men and never cried again like that time on the waters of the Sava River. This is the first English translation of the poem, which, as I said, I, did, I uh, performed for the 2014 Congress. This is an emo the emotional intensity is like almost never before. This is a transcript of tragedy and trauma into a poetical form. As the violence and tragedy are unprecedented, the poetical forms are also pushed beyond every person's previous limits and boundaries. It almost reminds one of the famous words of Theodor Adorno, there is no poetry after Auschwitz. Horror and poetry. We feel here the desperate effort of the poet to share a horror which cannot be shared. Shaul Chernichovsky, one of the most important Hebrew poets, served during this time as a military physician in the Russian army, sublimating his experience into an extraordinary cycle of sonnets called To the Sun, considered among his great, greatest creative achievements. He shaped the crisis of the world in war, a world of destruction and mass killing, stricken by terror and confusion, into this troubled world. The poet struggles to maintain his inner integrity and protect the universal human values he wishes to preserve. Standing between the living and the dying, such a terrible craftsmanship, holding the sharp scalpel, some is crying of joy, another is cursing, absorbing the last light into, foreign, into a foreign dying eye. For the rolling thunder of mighty guns in the meadows, to, to flashes of fire I tunneled alone, drew a last line, erased a lie from my page, from a bejeweled threshold, thus a gem is pulled. But in this glimmer, in the fading eye, in the light absorbing light before rising for eternity, but in this flash of fire penetrating and grating, in a fire calling fire commanding disaster and destruction, were you there? I was overwhelmed by your splendor. Was I welcoming him or was I created by another entity? Another prominent figure in Hebrew literature, Chaim Nachman Bialik, who later became the national poet, the poet laureate of Hebrew language, lived in Odessa during the summer of 1915 during which time he composed a poem and a story which clearly reflect the war. The poem is The Conductor of the Dances, which is basically a dance of death dominated by the atmosphere of disintegration and destruction. The prose story is The Shamed Tr Trumpet, which describes a meeting with a veteran Jewish reserve soldier conscripted for the war. Under the guise of a painful childhood memory of the soldier's family who underwent a traumatic experience, of, uh, of expulsion from their ho homes, the story raises serious questions about the reason and logic which leads Jews to cast their lives for the sake of hostile people and regime which detest and persecute them. This is leading to the clear logical solution, self-determination, i.e. Zionism. The terrible rapture of the soldiers in the trenches experiencing the horrors of war on a daily basis, as well as the severe upheaval of human society as a whole, are given unprecedented expression in literature. The Jews were no different, and many of them indeed immortalized their experience in the mother tongue. Siegfried Sassoon, a soldier in the British army, Teofil Tobias Reis, the Austro-Hungarian uh, of the Austro-Hungarian army, who was mentioned, Erwin, in yours wonderful paper we've enjoyed earlier in this Congress, and of course, oh, here's the book yeah, that you've mentioned as well. And of course, Isaac Babel, a soldier in the Russian army until his desertion, and then the person who described the Russian civil war in an extremely colorful manner. All these are particularly famous. There are also soldiers on both sides who used Hebrew to tell their stories. Most prominent among them, the men whose experiences as a warrior became one of the focal points in his literary work was Avigdor Hameiri. 
Avigdor Feuerstein was born in 1890 near Munkach, then Hungary, now Ukraine, in a family deeply rooted in Jewish tradition, but also in modernity. He studied Hebrew in a young age and soon exposed his literary tendencies when he began writing and publishing in his teens. His first poetry book was published when he was 21 years old, and soon the young man made a reputation for himself in Hebrew literature, as well as writer and journalist in Hungarian. He combined activities in the Zionist movement in Hungary with intensive involvement in the cultural and bohemian life of his native city of Budapest. Paradoxically, he saw himself as a nationalist Jew, but also as a Hungarian patriot, without giving himself any real account of the contradiction between the two components of his identity. In 1914, Hameiri, still Feuerstein, was swept away by the patriotic wave and volunteered for the Austro-Hungarian army. This passion was not This passion was not unusual among Jews, enthusiastic about the opportunities of modernism, which they believed had eroded the old anti-Semitism. Hameiri saw action in all the campaigns in Galicia, receiving a field commission. Captured by the Russians in 1916, he suffered many tribulations and hardships, imprisonment in various prisoner camps, including in Siberia, until he was released following the February 1917 revolution. Reaching Odessa, he was greeted with open arms by the many Hebrew writers and poets living there, where he vigorously renewed his literary activity until immigrating to Palestine in 1921. Hameiri was deeply and tragically traumatized by the war. There is no other Hebrew writer in whose work World War I is so significant. Two autobiographical novels, three collections of short stories, around 50 poems, a play, and a great deal of translated works all highlight this fact. The most prominent of them all is the autobiographical novel The Great Madness, Hashiga Onagadol, published in 1929. The same year, incidentally, as Erich Meyer remarks, uh, Invest in Neues, uh, of course, uh, uh, all quiet on the Western Front. These two books perfectly represent the later impact, the second wave of World War I literature. And I quote, for about three years, I lived in that huge madhouse, which encompassed more than half the planet, and a billion people who raged madly with all kinds of strange expressions, with enthusiasm, weeping, holiness, deception, innocence, sorrow, love, and tooth grinding. I watched it erupt, and I wondered. And while wandering, I was swept into the vortex. Then I found myself running wild in this surge of frenzy, trying not to let my mind blacken out. I tried to watch the doomed with sober eyes and look in myself, the good into myself, the good-hearted miserable. Did my eyes remain open and my mind sober? It is not for me to answer this question, the madman looking in the mirror. I did not embellish the facts, nor did I mar them. I, sim I did not add anything, nor I detract a single fact. I observed and waited for the end, for the return to sanity. But in the meantime, I saw the Jew in our midst, and even inside the madhouse, he remained a Jew, an ardent fool, a holy clown, an old child, a hated lover. I did not plan in advance to see the Jew in me and in my, and my comrades in death, but that's how it came about. In hindsight, it is for the better. This is an excerpt from the preface to this book, which was incidentally the first real bestseller in the Hebrew language. A fascinating, complex, dramatic, colorful, sweeping book that has never lost its appeal for the reader. This book can be clearly placed with the genre of war literature, which began to become created during the war with the book Le Feu, the, uh, Under Fire by Henri Barbus, which was published already in 1916, and continued with the books of Remarque, Sendra, Graves, Sassoon, and many others. Many motifs identified with the war literature also appear in Hameiri's book, the heavy battles which are in such stark contrast to the pastoral nature around, the diversity of the soldiers' characters, the various ways the soldiers deal with the routine or with the terrible reality of battle, through rumors, superstitions, sexual fantasies, promiscuity, drunkenness. All these aspects place the book in the universal dimension. But the book's messages are not blunt like the outright pacifist Dalton Trumbo's Johnny's Got His Gun. Hameiri's book is more subtle and sophisticated, not blatant and extrovert. 
Specifically, this book has another unique dimension. It is the only book which highlights the special situation to the point of a predicament of the Jewish soldier who found himself in a reality that is not only delusional and impossible for him as for all the soldiers, but doubly so as a Jew. Hameiri touches upon various aspects and dimensions of the Jewish reality. It does not settle for a simplistic and single-faceted approach. The wide variety of issues is outside the scope of this paper, but it is crucial to emphasize that for him, the great madness had, has clear lessons for Jews. The solution to the questions raised and the problems which became painfully clear to Jews is a national solution. Zionism is the way. The Jew who was prepared to sacrifice his life and shed blood for the motherland understands that the future for him lies in a separation from the present, strengthening the connection with the collective past of the Jewish people and returning to the historic homeland of the Jewish people, pledging allegiance to Zionism and the land of Israel. Avigdor Meiri was not the first writer to deal with a Jewish soldier as such, but he was certainly the first one to deal with the Jewish fighting men, the combat soldier whose war experience completely changed his perception for reality. And I have here, if afterwards you wish to, to look, the two volumes, uh, including his recollections from the captivity and some of his short war, war stories. And I wish to conclude with the last writer, the last author in my presentation. Uh, Aaron Reuveni, Shimshelevitz, was born in Poltava in 1886. He arrived in the United States when he was young, but returned to Russia upon the outbreak of the 1905 revolution. Not long afterwards, he was arrested with other family members and sent to Siberia, uh, where, uh, sent to Siberia uh, from which he escaped, and after many adventures, finally reached Palestine in 1910, where he became a writer and translator. By the way, his brother later rose to fame as the second president of the State of Israel, uh, Itzhak Ben Zvi. Reuveni's mo, most famous book, for which he was awarded so many prizes, was the novel Even to Jerusalem, Ad Yerushalayim in Hebrew, uh, which was published in a form of trilogy in 1954. Even to Jerusalem deals with Jewish life in Jerusalem during the First World War. It describes different people in their various corners when the great wave surged and threatened to drown them. This is a quote. The word wave refers to a war that almost destroyed the Jewish community in Eretz Israel, in Palestine, even before the war physically reached the area. The characters are the immigrants of the second Aliyah, second immigration wave, the Jews who immigrated to Ottoman Eretz Israel in the years 1904 to 1914, some of which are among the leaders of the Jewish community of the time. And at least one of the central plots and some of the subplots are based on real events that took place in the country during the war which makes at least one of the parts of the trilogy actually a historical novel. This three-part masterpiece moves smoothly and flawlessly between spheres, the intimate and personal to the general, the larger picture, between the private and subjective to the universal, the objective. Uh, the, uh, the grandest of all historical novels, Vaina Emir, War and Peace by Tolstoy, created standards for the author's ability to attempt to touch both spheres simultaneously. Even to Jerusalem, describe the implosion of the new settlement into the, into the old yeshuv, into the old uh, settlement, uh, uh, the old uh, uh, cities of the Jews uh, in, in Palestine during World War I. The physical and spiritual destruction of Jewish Jerusalem is the background to the stories of the personal and emotional turmoil of the characters. The spheres are directly connected, and they mirror one another, while historical and social reality, which proves the impact of the war on the Jewish world and on the Jewish person, seeking his way within the reality of Zionism, struggling for their path. World War I was so radically and permanently, in, was, was to radically and permanently influence the history of Zionism, directing it into a course which would lead, 30 years after the end of the war, with many tribulations in between, to the establishment of the State of Israel. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Alon. I think with a sweep of a few thousand years, you've managed to reach uh, the end of World War I. 
Um, I'm afraid we are a little bit um, over time already, and Randy is waiting for his last part. So I think we'll skip the questions on this, and I think you presented it so well that it would lead to a literary discussion rather to, than to a question and answers period. So Alon, thank you very much indeed. Thank all of you, thank the translators uh, for their job. Um, and Randy, I'm handing over to you now. Alon, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>